Hey, welcome back. So some time ago I made a video where I showed you a bunch of modifications and additions that I made for my lathe and since then I've done a number of new mods and improvements. So I figured it's time for another video to share some of my ideas. There's a bunch of minor stuff I improved, but we're also gonna cover some pretty extensive builds like the new accordion style way covers for the entire bed. I also updated the control panel once again and completely rebuilt my previous handwheel gearbox. But let's get to those bigger projects in a bit, because I want to start with something simple first. Every now and then I take everything off the lathe and give it a good cleaning, which can be quite a pain, because there's a lot of nooks and crannies on this machine that ships tend to find their way into. And getting them out gets pretty tedious, so that's what I want to tackle first. The worst spot is right under the spindle nose. If chips fall into this opening here, they end up in this hollow part of the base, which extends all the way under the headstock, and then there's another opening on the other side. So basically this entire hollow space under the headstock fills up with chips over time, and then you can imagine how annoying it is to clean that up. Then there's another gap in the back, which also extends all the way to the other side. So that's another spot where chips build up over time and are annoying to remove. Of course I could just ignore all of this and just never clean those spots, but I like to keep my machines clean and it just bothers me out of principle, so I came up with a few ways to close up those gaps so I just don't have to deal with it again. For the one in the back it turned out to be really easy. I just cut this piece of square tubing to the right length and it just happens to fit in there nice and snug. This area is a little bit more tricky because I need to plug it from the top and the bottom if I want it to stay clean. So for the bottom, I just got a piece of aluminum sheet and just kind of bent that to roughly match the shape of the casting down there. And then I just jammed it in there tight so it can't fall out. So this opening is fixed now and for the top I cut another piece of sheet metal that fits between the bedways to plug up this big hole up here. And then I just made this little thing from some plywood and chamfered the edges so it can be wedged in there. And the screw in the middle is just so I got something to grab onto if I need to get it out again. These few pretty simple steps have made the cleanup a lot easier, so let's move on to something else. So in the last video I made this shelf for my tool holders that attaches to the backsplash of the lathe. And since then I actually made an addition for that, which is a big work light. Unfortunately I didn't film that process, but it's not very exciting or complicated. It's basically just a frame that I welded up from aluminum tubing to keep it light. And then I strapped a bunch of cheap LED strips to it. And since it slides into the tubing for the shelf, this thing is also height adjustable. So this was pretty simple to make, but pretty effective for getting good uniform lighting in this whole area. So I figured I'd just show you the result here in case you want to implement something similar for your machine. Another minor addition here is that I added another small shelf to the backsplash on the right to put some additional stuff and also cold blued and painted some of the steel pieces to stop rust and make it look a little bit more finished. So next let's get to the most extensive build today which is the new way covers. In the last video I made these covers which are just some rubber flaps attached to a plate that I installed on top of the cross light. The solution is a bit crude, but it did work okay, there's nothing really wrong with it, but after a few years of use it just looks pretty rough. And while it does keep the bulk of the chips off the ways, it doesn't provide full coverage, which is something I'd like to change. Also, since these covers are attached to the cross light, they move back and forth on the X axis, which doesn't really make sense, so the plan is to fix that as well. So the reason why I'm adding the covers at all is not so much to protect the lathe from its own chips, which it's designed to deal with. The main reason is that my whole shop is in a single room and that means whenever I have to do stuff like grinding and sanding, the grinding dust that flies around the room can also settle on the lathe bed. And those abrasive particles are really bad for anything that has precision ground surfaces, like a lathe or mill, because they increase the wear on the waste to a huge degree unless you constantly clean the machine. So the white covers should protect against that somewhat. But of course in addition the covers also make cleaning up the normal chips a lot more convenient. So for the new version of the covers I want to use this accordion style material which is one of the standard solutions to protect moving parts on machine tools like on my mill here. 
There's lots of different styles of these collapsible covers, but it's kind of a rabbit hole that I don't want to get into here. I'm just going to say that this is about the cheapest and simplest solution within that realm. I bought this material on AliExpress and I'm going to put a link to that in the description, but I think they also sell something like this at McMaster Car and some similar places. So the idea is to have it cover the ways kind of like this, and while it might seem like a simple job at first, it actually got pretty complicated to do a clean installation, partly because one major aspect I wanted to include is to make these easy to remove if and when I do need access to the ways for cleaning and maintenance, or in case the covers get in the way for a certain operation. To start with, I removed everything from the cross slide, and one thing that makes everything more complicated is that I also got the glass scale from my DRO installed here. So I need to work around that somehow as well. My idea is that instead of the previous mounting solution for the scale, I'm gonna put an L-shaped aluminum profile down here, where the scale can sit inside, and then the way covers would be attached to the outside of that so they both can move independently. So first I had to shorten this a little bit and then cut away a few bits and mill some slots for mounting. Now it looks like this and I can attach it using the same threads that were already there before. And now I need to figure out how to attach the away covers to the aluminum. When you buy these covers they pretty much come without any mounting solutions, so it's up to you to figure out how to attach them to anything. First of all I want one cover on both sides of the carriage, so the entire bed is covered. So I'm cutting this piece apart in the middle and it cuts quite easy just using a box cutter. I did of course check before whether the pieces are actually long enough because while they can extend quite a bit, you don't want to stretch them out too much, so I'd suggest getting them a bit longer than you think and you can always shorten them. Next I cut a bunch of aluminum strips to the same width as the covers and drilled a bunch of holes and then the end of the cover gets sandwiched between two of those strips using small rivets. Now this can be attached to the bracket I made before and that solves the installation on the carriage side. So next is figuring out how to attach the other side to the headstock. Like I said, I want this to be quickly removable without tools on at least one side. So I figured I'm gonna go with the magnets for this one, which will be going inside this piece of aluminum. The cover material did come with a plastic strip glued to each end, so on this side I only had to drill two holes and then I can just screw this against the magnet bar. Here's how the finished cover on this side looks now. We got magnets on one side and the bracket on the other side, so let's do a test install. And I'm very happy with the magnet solution. The magnets are so strong that I had to add this little tab here because you can't pry this off otherwise. Since the magnets are recessed into this aluminum bar, there's also no problem with chips getting stuck to it, which is the reason I normally avoid using magnets around these machines, but I haven't had any problems with that, uh, with this solution. Now on the other side we can install the bracket here, and then the DRO scale goes inside like this, but before I can install that I have to make a new mounting bracket for it. The scale used to be screwed against this little part here, which installs into the back of one of the T-slots. And this did work, but it was never a great solution, and it also wouldn't work with what I'm about to do. So since I need to add a support piece back here anyway, for the future chip shield to rest on, I'm gonna combine that with a new way to install the scale. 
So first let's make a few parts and then I'm gonna show you what I mean. This part can now screw into the back of the cross light and later on the chip shield will rest on this. And then the scale is also installed to this part using this little extension. And in front it can be mounted the same way as before by directly screwing it into the cross light. Now I can also attach the reading head for the scale again. And as you can see the cross light now moves independently from the attachment point for the covers which was the main goal here. So now I can also attach the covers on this side and we can give this a try and it looks to be working well so far. But like I said I want to cover the bed ways completely so the next task is to figure out how to put covers between the carriage and the tailstock. Again this comes with its own set of challenges. There's also a bunch of stuff on this side that needs to be accessible. We got this screw here which operates the carriage lock then there's a bunch of gib adjustment screws and also the lock for the cross light. I don't use the locks all the time but they do need to stay somewhat accessible and again I don't want to attach the covers to the cross light itself because I don't want them moving on the x-axis. So that means they need to attach directly to the carriage somehow and I figured my best bet for that would be to make use of this flat surface down here between the ways. To make the covers easy to remove I'm gonna use magnets again which will attach down here somewhat like this so I need to create sort of a T-shaped plate to achieve that. And I already measured and sketched out the basic shape here, so let's make this part next. I always keep a whole bunch of different styles of magnets around because they often come in handy, especially the ones that actually come with a good attachment method, like these ones here that were perfect for this job. Now the plate can attach like this and the carriage lock is actually still usable with this installed and it clears everything else, so that's looking good. To attach the covers I cut some threads into the plate and then just drilled into the plastic strips on the covers again. Now that this side is solved the next task is to attach the other side to the tailstock which luckily is quite simple so first I added some more aluminum strips to the cover so that I can screw this end directly to the tailstock casting which means I need to cut some threads first. I also ended up milling a little step into the aluminum strip on one side to create some clearance because it was colliding with the carriage before a little bit, which limits the travel. And speaking of travel, if you fully compress the covers, they do still have some thickness to them, which is something to keep in mind because it actually keeps me from sliding the tailstock closer to the carriage here. However, you can just flip them up to move them out of the way. And even like this, they still interfere with things a lot less than my previous solutions with their big flaps. With both sides done now, we can finally give this a little bit of a test drive and so far it's working out great. I also discovered another little feature here that I didn't even plan for. If the cover is removed on this side, it can actually be tucked under the tailstock using the magnets, which is super handy if I need it out of the way for a moment, or if I need to get the tailstock in there all the way. 
The next step is to now close up all those gaps around the cross light. So the idea is to put some kind of plate there again to act as a chip shield, but this time without covering the surface of the cross light, which means it needs a cutout to fit around the outside. To start with, I'm cutting up some aluminum sheet to size again, and I want to put a very accurate rectangular cutout in there, so I'm gonna use the mill for that. But since the big piece of sheet metal creates a lot of vibrations when you try to mill it, I'm screwing this down onto a sacrificial piece of wood, which should keep the vibrations down and also give me something to hold onto in the vise. Now I can start cutting it with a little end mill, and I'm using a little bit of coolant here because the wood underneath can make the end mills run quite hot. But looking at those birds, I think this ant mill is pretty much clapped out anyway. I did of course put the screws in the middle so that the holes are in the piece that I don't use. And now it's just missing some mounting holes. Doing a test fit here and this came out really nice. It fits around the cross slide with pretty much no gaps. So that's gonna make sure now the chips are gonna make it past. On the spindle side this gets a folded edge to cover the glass scale and my DIY metal brake is a bit too flimsy for this job, but I did manage to get it done somehow. Before I can install the cover I need another support surface in front of the cross light and to prepare the mounting points for that I have to unfortunately disassemble the whole hand wheel because it turns out I can't get in there with the drill otherwise. Now I can drill and tap two holes, and this is the little support bracket I made that can be installed there. Now we're just gonna transfer the mounting holes from the cover plate, and then there's also the satisfying moment of taking the protective foil off. After some finishing, there's only one thing missing now. I also need an edge that extends down a little bit on the other side to close the gaps between the chip shield and the way covers. But it needs to be able to flip up, because otherwise it would block the magnetic plate that the covers are attached to from being pulled out. So my idea is to make some sort of hinge. Instead of using a mechanical hinge, I'm gonna make one from this super tough canvas material. I'm not sure what the correct name for this is, but I used this in a bunch of projects, so I know it's virtually indestructible, and I'm gonna use the same sandwich construction again to attach it using some rivets. So now with this flexible edge finished, it's time to do the final installation. I also added a little flap in front of the chip shield, which is to cover the cross light ways when it's all the way in the back. Now you can see the reason for that flexible edge. When I want to attach or remove this cover, it simply flips up and when it's down, it keeps the chips from migrating under the chip shield. And at the same time, getting the covers on and off is still very quick and easy. One big advantage of this new chip shield over my old solution is that this time it doesn't cover the top of the cross slide. So the mounting surface and the T-slots are still fully accessible. Speaking of T-slots, to keep those from getting clogged up, I also made these little things to plug them up when they're not in use. They also have some clearance built in at one end, and this creates a pocket that allows me to keep a set of T-nuts hidden under there. So if I want to install a top slide or something, I don't need to fumble those in and out. 
So the new solution for the covers is finally finished now and I'm not sure if it comes across in the video but this task turned out to be quite a bit of work and involved a lot of problem solving but I think it was well worth the effort because this feels a lot more like the final proper solution now that I'm hopefully going to keep as long as this machine. And if you want to improve your problem solving skills you might want to check out today's sponsor which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an interactive platform that helps you learn about and understand a lot of different topics around STEM fields like physics, engineering, mathematics, computer science and much more. There's a huge amount of courses for any knowledge level and I think they're using a great approach because I'm a very learning by doing type of person myself and that's exactly how Brilliant works since it relies heavily on interactive learning. That means for anything you learn on Brilliant, whether it be something simple or advanced, the lessons are always interactive. So you can experiment and intuitively understand the concepts. Especially for very theoretical stuff like math, it personally helps me a lot to see things visualized and actually get real life examples for how the knowledge is applied. To give you an example, I really enjoyed the scientific thinking course because it's a very accessible one and it can help you wrap your head around basic engineering concepts like how gears or pulley systems work by both offering good explanations and also letting you have fun while learning. It can even help you with your pool game by laying out the physics behind how the balls interact with each other. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash philvandelay. The first 200 of you will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. And with that, let's get back to the video. So next up is another small improvement. The way I had this display mounted so far was not very elegant and also a bit wobbly because I used some flimsy scrap tubing back then. So I want to make a nicer and more sturdy mounting solution for that by building a little post that installs onto the headstock. I started by cleaning up this steel tube here and welded some scrap to the bottom to create a base and then turned that round and cleaned everything up on the lathe. bottom gets a mounting hole and then I just put a socket head screw in there and press the nut in at the top and welded that in. So the screw inside is now a captive screw and you'll see the reason for that in a bit. Then the whole thing gets cleaned up as well so it all looks like one piece and now I just need to drill and tap some threads to the cover plates on the headstock that I made in the last video to install this. Since I'm indecisive, I made three mounting holes, so I can change the position later if I want to or attach something else up there. And now comes the neat part. The nut I welded on top is big enough so I can stick an Allen key in there that fits the screw inside. So now I can use this to attach it to the plate and then on top it gets this little extension piece. And now with the display installed, I can swing this around to bring it into a comfortable position. It's a lot more sturdy than before and overall this was a pretty quick and easy but effective improvement. So the next one is technically I guess another redo of a previous improvement. In the last video I briefly talked about how I exchanged the original control panel for this lathe and installed new switches because I didn't like the controls it had before. This was definitely an improvement, but after using it for some time, I still wasn't 100% happy with it. While these up-down switches make sense for the speed and direction control, having a single up and down switch to start and stop the spindle always felt a bit unintuitive to me. So I want to change up the panel once more and install these dedicated buttons for the spindle control. One more thing I want to change is the main power switch. This actually is a two-way switch, so it has two on and one off position. And the reason is that you can, in theory, buy a milling attachment for this lathe. Even though I've never actually seen it for sale anywhere. And that's why the power switch has two positions. But for me this switch is pretty pointless. And since I want to install more buttons, I need to free up some space on this panel anyway. So I want to replace that with this switch here, because it's not as big. It fits with the other switches 
it makes more sense and it looks like it came out of an airplane which is awesome So I want to put all switches in a row with even spaces, but I don't want to make an entirely new plate. So to deal with the existing holes that don't match the new layout, I figured I'm just gonna weld them shut and then machine everything flat and drill some new holes. For the bigger hole in the middle I made this little plug and then the smaller ones I can just fill up directly. Then I took off most of the material with an end mill and cleaned up the rest with an orbital sander because those are a lot better for leaving a flat uniform surface compared to an angle grinder. And now the plate is looking nice and clean and you can barely tell it had any holes there before so it's time to drill two additional holes now and enlarge the ones for the new buttons. I also decided to clean up the cutout for the display a little bit because when I first made this plate it didn't come out super clean, especially the chamfers looked a bit rough because I just made them with the file back then. So this time I machined some chamfers, which immediately made this look a lot better. I also decided to paint the whole plate black, because it matches the rest of the lathe a lot better, and now I can start installing all the new switches. So the circuit board here talks to the VFD, that controls the motor and it has all the little switches for the original touch buttons on it. Just like last time I'm not gonna mess with those, all I'm doing is simply soldering all the cables from my new buttons onto the contacts for the original buttons from the back. So I'm just bypassing those, which means if I wanted to I could remove all of this and restore it to its original state. Now it's time to reinstall this whole mess and this time I also got some nicer screws for that which are actually the right length. The controls all seem to work correctly, so the only thing left to do now is to print some labels and with that the new panel is finished. Everything works and I don't think I could improve this further at this point, but while I was working on this area, there was one more small potential improvement that caught my attention. For some reason the manufacturer for this lathe decided to put the threading table on top of the gearbox cover here, which doesn't make a lot of sense because it's one of the places you always put tools and other stuff, so it's gonna get scratched up over time, and it's also kind of inconvenient to read up there. So that's not ideal, because this table contains some pretty important information for running the lathe, but it turns out there is a much better spot for this, so I decided to move it. So it turns out, down here where they put this useless sticker telling you the specs of the lathe, the table happens to fit perfectly, almost like that's how it was planned originally. So I just removed the stickers and cleaned everything up and drilled some small holes so that I can reattach it properly using rivets. And this was just a really small quick improvement, but it just makes a lot more sense now compared to how it came out of the box. For the last major build today, I'm once again gonna revisit an old modification. In the last late video I showed this hand wheel mod, which is basically a little gearbox I built that changes the gear ratio for the carriage hand wheel. The reason for that is that sometimes with these import machines, some strange and inexplicable design decisions are made, and in its stock condition, the gearing for the hand wheel on this machine is just way too high, meaning the carriage moves a pretty big distance for each revolution of the hand wheel compared to other lathes. 
That's great if you want to move the carriage really fast, but it's absolutely terrible for moving it with any kind of precision, which is a lot more important because the whole point of a metal lathe is to be accurate. So this gearbox reduces that speed by a factor of 1 to 4, which gives me much finer control and that helped a lot for actually hitting dimensions. With that being said, there's a few things about this I don't like. One is that, since I use two gears to keep it simple, the gearbox reverses the feet direction, so the hand wheel spins the other way compared to before. Which is not a huge deal, because you get used to it quickly, but it's very confusing for anyone who isn't used to this lathe and vice versa. But what bothers me more is just the build quality on this. It's a bit bad, because I built this a long time ago with less experience, so it just feels a bit wonky and also introduces quite a bit of drag. So I feel like I could make a much more refined version of this now that fixes those things, so that's what I'm going to tackle next. The solution for the feed direction problem is actually pretty simple and somehow it just didn't occur to me back then. Uh, it turns out I can just use a drive belt instead of gears. In that case belt pulleys turn in the same direction and this also eliminates any play in the mechanism and should feel a lot smoother overall. So I think that's a better solution for this case. This time I also made a quick little mock-up in CAD just to figure out some of the dimensions and where everything needs to go. The idea is that this time the hand wheel goes on the side instead of the front of the carriage. And that way I also solved another issue I had with the old gearbox, which was that the hand wheels were too close together and would sometimes get in each other's way when you're trying to grab the handle. So let's start by making that support block that goes on the side. With the basic shape finished, it just needs a hole now for a bushing. I'm going to make the bushing from some POM, which is a kind of plastic, because for this application I don't think the ball bearings are even necessary, and this is a very inexpensive and easy solution. This part is now done, so next I need to make a little shaft. The one I'm making here actually got scrapped later. I ended up making a second shaft, but I didn't film that one, so I'm showing you the first one because it was basically the same process. The only thing I changed is that I added a little flange on one side, but you're gonna see that in a second. After turning everything to the right diameter, it gets some key seats, one for the hand wheel and one for the belt pulley.
I know I should really get some new end mills looking at these burrs, but it's not as bad as it looks once you get them off. Next I need to modify this little pulley a bit, and since it has those flanges on the outside, this is super awkward to hold in a lathe chuck, because there's virtually nothing to grab onto. I tried it anyway, and it's definitely a bit sketchy, but at least for some careful drilling this works. But eventually I made these sleeves, because I also need to do some facing, and I think that would have launched it from the chuck. It's a bit wobbly now, but it should be good enough since I just need to trim down the end there. Now this also needs a keyway, and luckily I did happen to have the right size keyway brush this time, so making this one was easy. Now I'm reaming the bigger gear to the right diameter and this also needs a keyway, but unfortunately I didn't have a brooch for that size, but there's another trick you can use. I used an end mill the same size as the key and just cut a round keyway like this and then I could just file the corner square with a needle file. It takes a bit more work than broaching, but it definitely comes out a lot straighter than if you try to file the entire keyway. So here's the second version of the shaft that I talked about earlier. Like I said, it's basically the same except for that flange in the middle, which the hand wheel can be screwed against. And that just helped to secure it better and make it run more true, because it was a bit wobbly with the first shaft. So with all the parts done now, it's time to install everything. There's a lock nut in the back here to set the preload, and once that's adjusted, there's absolutely zero play in the bushing. And the shaft turns very smooth and true, so I'm happy with the fit, and that's already a big improvement over the old one. And what's also nice is that if this bushing ever gets worn out, I can make a new one in like 10 minutes. Now we just need to drill and tap some threads again to mount this, and before drilling into anything on the lathe, I check the drawings in the manual to make sure there's nothing behind here that I might drill into. The big pulley now goes onto the shaft where the hand wheel would normally sit. Then this assembly goes on the side and I made some slots there instead of holes because that allows for just enough adjustment to put some tension on the drive belt. Now the hand wheel can be installed and upon the first test it feels very good but the install is not quite finished because it's actually made a cover for this as well which is one of those things where 3D printing is just perfect because it's a highly custom part but it doesn't need much structural strength. And what I especially like about this is that I was able to design this so that it gets attached to the threads that I used for the old gearbox. So that way I don't have some useless holes in the carriage and also don't need to drill any new ones to install this. There's still enough space to adjust the belt in there, and of course it also has a front cover which just pops in place with a very satisfying click. There's one last minor thing I want to fix now, and that is the handle. If you watched this channel before, you know I have a pet peeve about cheap noisy handles on machines, which is why I keep replacing them. The original handle works fine, but the rattling each time you use it just drives me nuts. And these things are just a crappy design, because they always have too much play on that shaft and there's no way to adjust it. So once again I'm making a custom replacement handle, which I've made countless versions of at this point.
and they're pretty easy to make. It's just an aluminum sleeve that a socket head screw drops into and then it has a lock nut on one end to adjust it and take out the play. And combined with a bunch of grease in there, that's really all you need for a quite smooth handle. And now finally, with the new gearbox and the new handle installed, this whole mechanism makes it almost feel like a different machine. I couldn't believe how much smoother it feels compared to before. The movement is super smooth, the drag is way down, the feet direction is now correct again, and there's a lot more space around the hand wheel. Overall it just feels much more satisfying to use. So I'm very happy I revisited this, because at this point I would almost call this a perfect solution. So this concludes the last build for this round of improvements, but before I end the video, there's a few little footnotes I want to add. First of all, there's a bunch of other minor stuff I improved that didn't make it into the video, like improving the fit and finish on some stock parts, like the feed selection mechanism here. And I also made some more handles and overhauled the entire tail stock. But this is a pretty long video and there's some extra stuff I quickly want to mention, so the build part is now over in case you don't want to sit through 5 more minutes of me talking. So there's one potential issue with the new way covers that you probably should know about if you also want to install accordion style covers on your lathe. Since these covers are only folded in one direction, they do have a tendency to sort of pop up when they are either quickly compressed or clogged up with chips. For the rear cover this is not really a problem, and like I showed it can even be helpful to flip up the covers so they don't limit the travel. But near the chuck it's a different story, because if they pop up there there's a chance they might get caught or hit by the chuck or by a workpiece. So I tried some solutions to fix that, and the first was to use a bunch of pieces of flat bar to act as weights to keep the covers down. This did kind of work, but with enough chips in there they would still pop up sometimes, and I also figured that even if I glued them on or something, having these steel pieces there might actually be more risky, because if those get caught by the chuck they could become a projectile, so this was not a good solution. The best solution I found eventually was to add a small steel rod that sits inside the lathe bed, low enough for the carriage to pass over it. In this case I just attached it to that chip plug that I hammered in this gap earlier and on the other end it doesn't even need to be attached to anything, so it just kind of floats there. Then I punched small holes into the covers at about every third or second fold and put a zip tie through each one. And now the steel rod runs through those loops and pulls the covers down onto the bed and this makes it impossible for them to pop up. There's probably a much more elegant way to do the same thing, but it does work well and I haven't had any problems with the covers interfering with anything since then, so even though the implementation is a bit quick and dirty, I think it's a good proof of concept and I might improve that at some point too, but for now it works fine and I just wanted to show an approach for this problem in case you want to try the same thing. One other new feature I wanted to quickly mention, because I know people are gonna ask, is the chuck on the tool post. You might have seen earlier that I was drilling a hole using the carriage rather than the tailstock. And I can't even begin to list how awesome and helpful this is, and I wish I would have found out about it way sooner. It's another thing I picked up in a Stefan Gotteswinter video where he explains how we set this up, which is why I'm just gonna refer to his video for that. But just to show you the basic setup, all I did was to buy this tool holder from my multifix tool post, which is normally used for a big boring bar. But instead of that I just installed this sleeve that has a morse taper inside, and then you can just insert a chuck of your choice, and that's pretty much it. I didn't build any of this stuff, it's all just off the shelf tooling that you should be able to buy for most tool post systems. Centering this to the spindle is solved by saving a home position on the DRO and using the height adjustment on the tool holder. Like I said, if you want to learn about this in much more detail, just check out Stefan's video, which I'm gonna link in the description. I basically just wanted to let you know that this option exists, because I didn't know about it for way too long, and it makes drilling on the lathe so much faster and easier. Alright, that's all for this one. I feel like that was a lot of talking this time, so hopefully you could take away something useful from this video. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.